explain Texas? Well, it's the home of NASA and also the big Texan steak ranch, home of the 72 ounce eat it all and you don't pay T-bone extravaganza, replete with a quarter acre of salad and a baked potato the size and texture of a sofa. Texas has given us Bill Hicks, Cormac McCarthy, and George Bush Jr. It's home to some of the savviest people on the planet and also some of the most inept. Texas could put a man on the moon, but they couldn't manage to get a president down the street without him getting shot in the head. Thus, it's hard to explain Texas, or why, when Texans leave Texas, they feel the need to brag about how they're from Texas. After all, people from Bogner Regis never strut around bragging about how they're from Bogner Regis. It's because Bogner Regis has no identity whatsoever. Texas has an identity, even if it's primarily mythical. The stars at night are big and bright. Countless films have been set in Texas. More often than not in these films, Texas is not just the setting, it's the stage. It's arrogant and proud and overtly masculine, bigger than any of the characters inhabiting it. Texas has to be bigger and better than the other 49 states. The question is, why? Texas is, is huge. It's, it's, it is the biggest state in the nation. I don't know what they're talking about when they say Alaska is bigger. I don't even, I've never seen Alaska, so I know that Texas is bigger. I've got that right that I can do that. It's pro-business, anti-tax, fiscally conservative. Its internal economy is larger than Australia, slightly behind Russia. It leads the nation in energy use, in alcohol-related driving deaths, in carbon dioxide emissions, and in Baptist churches. It's staunchly religious and wildly consumptive, often at the same time. In August of 2012, a man named Ernesto Gaza from Beeville, Texas, sat down to his breakfast and noticed the image of Jesus staring up at him from a burrito. When the Beeville Picayune News printed a picture of the miraculous burrito, it was obvious that several bites had been taken out of it. See, only in Texas would a man look at a burrito and say, that's the image of Jesus, but that is a good looking burrito. I'm just gonna eat around Jesus and then call the paper. It runs very deep into your soul. Maybe being a Texan is the biggest thing. If Texas comes off a little brusque, that's because it is. They don't have a lot of regard for your personal space. Texas is your friend, but it's the kind of friend that calls you up late at night to ask if it's okay to hook up with your ex. Helps itself to seconds without asking. That kind of friend. You don't have to be born in Texas to be a Texan. Why, if you move to Texas, you're a Texan. If you're just traveling through Texas, as long as you're in Texas, by God, you're a Texan. They're not overtly concerned with what goes on beyond their borders. As far as Texas is concerned, there's only two states in America. There's Texas and there's Taft. And Taft stands for this ain't fucking Texas. Texas could they turn an anti-littering campaign into a declaration of identity. Most other states aren't quite as emphatic about their rules for behavior, but for the record, don't make eye contact with Mississippi. Don't call Oregon after 11 p.m. And don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like Nevada? There are more Texans in the U.S. Armed Forces than from any other state. So you could say that one of the underlying characteristics of being a Texan is they like a fight. You could add to that that Texans are stubborn. And in any situation, you can always rely on a Texan to stand firm. This is never truer than when Texans meet Mexicans. On March 6th, 1836, here at the Mission San Antonio de Valero, also known as the Alamo, 
311 men gave their lives so that someday they could build a Guinness Book of World Records museum right on these hallowed grounds. That the purpose of this rebellion, the purpose of the Texas Revolution, is to fully restore their federal constitution of 1824. Every student in Texas is required to spend his or her seventh year studying Texas history. But what makes Texas, Texas isn't its history, it's its myth. Its history and myth is so intertwined that it's impossible to envision the truth about this place. So they don't need to know all their history. They merely need to invoke that single eternal rallying cry, remember the Alamo. 185 men fighting to their deaths against a horde of 7,000 in the most savage hand-to-hand -hand combat in history. And you will always remember the Alamo. Texas was once part of Mexico, and ever since a couple of hundred tenacious young men took on half the Mexican army in the name of independence, the Alamo has been a story close to every Texan's heart. Even Texans who don't know the Alamo story know that there's something called the Alamo that they're supposed to be proud of. And for some people, it's the pop culture that they know and not the real history. We kind of have to use it as a starting point to say, you know, John Wayne really wasn't at the Alamo. The true participants of the Alamo are seen as heroic figures, the most prominent of which, of course, is Davy Crockett immortalized in film and song and story. With him was Jim Bowie of knife fame. They were led by William Barrett Travis, who penned the immortal words, I shall never surrender or retreat. Victory or death. They fought off the Mexican army for 13 days. All but two men paid the ultimate price. It's here at last. The monumental history-making motion picture. In film, the Alamo has been made twice. Ironically, both are incredibly forgettable. The 1960 version, directed by John Wayne and starring John Wayne as Davy Crockett, is an elephantine, strident, historically muddled treatise on patriotism that was released to coincide with putting Richard Nixon in the White House. It's my turn. That idea bombed. So did the film. It's hard to play a legend when you're a bigger legend than the legend you're supposed to be playing. I'm gonna tell you something, Flacco, and I want you to listen tight. When I come down here to Texas, I was looking for something. I didn't know what. There's right and there's wrong. You gotta do one or the other. You do the one and you're living. You do the other and you may be walking around, but you're dead as a beaver hat. Hollywood should have known to leave the story alone after that. After all, why are we supposed to cheer for a bunch of Texans who are fighting for independence when we know that less than nine years later they'd sell their grandmother down to Brazos to be part of the U.S. of A? But in 2004, we get the touchy-feely, Disney touchy-feely stone version of the Alamo. This one claims to be more historically accurate, which in films means it's only a matter of time before one of the characters does a voiceover as he's pinning a letter home. Like Glory or Braveheart, we sit around for two plus hours waiting for the inevitable battle and wondering just how many Celtic panpipe players can you employ for one movie soundtrack. Billy Bob Thornton takes over for the Duke, playing Crockett as some kind of glad-handing, toothy good old boy who's never far removed from his own celebrity awareness. If it was just me, simple old David from Tennessee, I might drop over that wall some night and take my chances. But that Davy Crockett feller, they're all watching him. That version tanked as well, possibly because tetchy post-9-11 Americans weren't too keen on seeing a film about martyrs holed up in a religious site that begins with the word owl. Still, it's a rite of passage for every 13-year-old kid to be dragged into the cinema by his dad to watch Jim Bowie and Davy Crockett get bayoneted. They never point out that the Alamo wasn't about religious freedom or taxation or removing a maniacal despot. It was about men fighting to own land that didn't belong to them in the first place. But don't tell that to Texans. And the 180 were challenged by Travis to die. Why these men had even come to Texas in the first place can be summed up in two words, cheap land. Houston's call to arms, published in American newspapers, was very clear on the subject. 
If volunteers from the United States will join their brethren in this section, they will receive liberal bounties of land. We have millions of acres, unchosen and unappropriated. Hey, Santa Ana, we're killing your soldiers below. Jim Bowie from Kentucky was a slave trader and a land speculator who knew an opportunity when he saw one. Davy Crockett was a coonskin, cap-wearing, hillbilly politician from Tennessee who had just been humiliated in an election back east, like Mitt Romney. William Travis, who was born in South Carolina and who happens to be my great-great-great-great-uncle, or so I'm told, had deserted his pregnant wife, young child, and a mountain of debt. For the record, I am nothing like him. I've never deserted my mountain of debt. What they thought was, we really don't think we're going to have to die. People are going to come and help us. And the tragedy is that people are coming. Travis is sending out his letters. People are responding. They just don't get here in time. The Alamo is a monument to heroism, not intelligence. It's fairly obvious that Travis's men didn't have to die here. It wasn't even a strategic position. It was just a, a mission turned into an army barracks. They could have abandoned it at any time and joined up with General Sam Houston, who was desperate for recruits. Newspapers back east had a page one story on their hands, and they mined it for all it was worth. An epic tale of Davy Crockett and his stoic counterparts fighting to the death. Thermopylae. And that is the core of Texas character even today. Us versus them. So the Mexicans came, the Texans were slaughtered, and to this day, Travis's words still filled Texans with misty-eyed pride. In 1999, America's Ryder Cup team was in danger of losing to Europe. George Bush Jr. sent a copy of Travis's victory or death letter to the golfers. A Texan golfer named Justin Leonard read those words and promptly went out and sank a 45-foot putt, and America won. The men at the Alamo did not die in vain. A month after the massacre, Texans rallied under General Sam Houston and cry in Remember the Alamo defeated General Santa Ana's entire army at the San Jacinto River. The battle lasted 19 minutes. Santa Ana turned all of Texas loose and it became independent. Now that it was a nation, Texas could set about getting rid of anyone that got in the way of its expansion. That's right. You're not the Texas. That's right. You're not the Texas. Mexicans, Tejanos, and Native people were forcibly removed, and a plea for real Americans to come to Texas was issued by the new president, Sam Houston, who yet again offered land to anyone back east who was fed up with the rat race and who wanted to be part of making Texas a great new republic. Texas won't you live with? The Texas that uh, John Wayne was fighting for in 1960 isn't the same Texas as today. For instance, San Antonio has a population of almost 2 million. It's 45% Hispanic. It also has huge communities of Guatemalans and Salvadorans and uh, Palestinians, other Arabs, Chinese, Vietnamese. In 2011, the most common name for newborn boys in Texas was Jose. Still, its border is patrolled like a military DMZ. The history of Texas expansion has always been about selectivity, kind of like its memory. I think when I think about what's most important to me, whether it's being a Jew or being an American you know, or being a Texan, Maybe being a Texan is the biggest thing. It isn't the faint of heart that come to Texas, but it's those people who are bold. And that really has an effect on the development of the Texas personality because of who did come here. Rum fake is your ascender. Rum fake black mama made. Big so your father had an idea to build this place he did he moved in from chicago and when he first came down here he wanted to put a western style steakhouse that cowboys would go to 
And he had the idea to cash in their payroll checks and serve them 25 cent beer, which meant that they started drinking. They started spending most of their checks while they were in there. And then he noticed that half of them could eat monstrously big sizes of food. The us versus them, undermanned and overwhelmed Texas mentality still applies today in the form of meat. At the Big Texan Steak Ranch, they'll attack a four-pound slab of steak as if it was Santa Ana's army. This is a 72-ounce challenge at the Big Texan. Four pounds of meat. You have to hit the challenge. You have to eat this, a baked potato and four shrimps and a salad with three shrimps within an hour. If you do not finish it within an hour, it costs $72. Rum fake, you're a fender. Rum fake like mama made. That's about half. <laughs> I've only eaten half of this steak. So much pressure. There's no profile that of people that do it. I've seen a young man that was 11 years old. I ate the 72 ounce steak. I've seen a grandmother that was 68 years old do it. I've seen uh, one man ate two of them in one hour. Did someone put you up to this? I was just driving down the road and saw the sign, and I had to stop. You got a long way to go. I feel like uh, I'm going to be eating steak for the next couple days. <laughs> it's the uh, mystique of Texas. Is everything really bigger in Texas? Do we really eat a lot? Do we really all have oil wells and ride horses to work? Well, of course we do. I mean, we always have, always will do. But it's a challenge. It's like the battery on your shoulder. Come knock this off. Are you a real cowboy? Are you a real Texan? Are you big enough to be a big Texan? I eat one of these steaks. Somebody should have told me not to do this. I have all my fans at home watching on the internet. See, the genius of the Big Texan steak is that it appeals to Americans by making them a mouth-watering offer, and far too late they realize they're in way over their heads. Around 2005, this exact economic model was adopted by bankers and mortgage lenders in America, which goes a long way toward explaining why our current economy is in the dumper. What does it mean to be a Texan? The right to wear a hat like this, a shirt like this, and a kerchief like this. It's, it's, it's being proud of the state, that that's the honor of being Texan, the bragging rights. I ate two thirds of it. It's still bigger than my face. Texas was bigger than me today. The 72 ounce steak challenge is a uniquely Texan experience. It exists not only because of the huge Texas psyche, but also it's because it's in its history. Out on the plains, down there Santa Fe, I met a cowboy riding the range one day, and as he jogged along, I heard him singing our most peculiar cowboy song. It was a ditty he learned in the city. Come on, hi, hi, hi. Come on, hi, you play. Texas is and always will be the home of the cowboy. Those images of cowboys herding their cattle in vast plains are embedded in cinematic history. But it's not just movies, it's also the reality. The cowboy wouldn't be anything without his horse or his cattle. It all started with one breed. If the Longhorn Cow was a car, it would be a Land Rover. For the first true pioneers of Texas, left behind by the Mexicans when they retreated across the Pecos River after the surrender at San Jacinto. They're nimble, mean, savvy. The first to know when storms and blizzards and blue northers are coming. They eat like crazy, then they hide in the underbrush. And they use those clown stickers to protect themselves against coyotes and cougars and other predators. The Longhorn will forever be associated with Texas. She continues to represent the romance of the American Old West. She seems to be the perfect cow, except for one thing. Okay, how come in every cowboy film you see where the cowboys are surrounded by Longhorn cows are they never eating a goddamn steak? It's always stew. 
because the longhorn cow is the stringiest, rubberiest, most inedible cow there is. All you can do is disguise the taste. Now, longhorn cattlemen, of course, in their defense will tell you, oh, it's lean, it's fat-free, so is a tire tread. Still, if it wasn't for longhorn cattle, Texas wouldn't be here today. Back during the Civil War, Texans went to fight for the Confederacy, and while they were gone, as the war raged, all the domesticated cows they left behind indulged in a four-year orgy. By the time the Texans came back, they were everywhere. So while the rest of the defeated South suffered, at least Texans were able to sell inedible beef and itchy, scratchy hides to the victorious North. See how that works? Cowboys realized that with intensive crossbreeding with European cattle, the beef was a better quality. Made them 10 times more money up north. All they had to do was get the cantankerous suckers past 800 miles of roaring rivers, canyons, badlands, rustlers, bureaucrats who turned them back because they carried ticks, which caused bovine influenza, also known as Texas fever. Also, hostile Indians, not so hostile, but financially scrupulous Indians who charged them 10 cents a head to cross their land to ultimately reach the nearest railhead at Abilene, Kansas. This route became known as the Chisholm Trail. Chisholm, leave your smutty asides at the door, Britain. Chisholm, named after the Cherokee trader and wrangler Jesse Chisholm. That's right, first cowboy was an Indian. Okay, maybe not the first cowboy. Seeing as how that term was invented by the Brits 150 years earlier as a translation of the word vaquero, as in buckaroo. During the Revolutionary War, the term cowboy was used to describe loathsome Americans who sided with the Brits. Today, it's a term used to describe loathsome Brits who put up siding. <laughs> Still, Jesse Chisholm was the first cowboy with solid business acumen. The guy knew his stuff. In 1948, Hollywood wasn't ready for a story about an Indian becoming a cow entrepreneur, so it conveniently replaced Jesse Chisholm with John Wayne. Howard Hawks' Red River is still considered one of the greatest westerns ever made. The story opens in 1851, with a wagon train heading west from St. Louis to California. Among the travelers is Thomas Dunstan, John Wayne. As wagons travel through North Texas, Dunstan is impressed with the land and decides he'll leave the wagon train and head south with two cows and one bull to start a ranch. Give me 10 years and I'll have that brand on the gates of the greatest ranch in Texas. 10 years and I'll have the Red River D on more cattle than you've looked at anywhere. I'll have that brand on enough beef to, to feed the whole country. Good beef for hungry people. Red River is a stunning western stocked with grizzled galoots on horses and yodeling cowboys driving streams of cattle across spectacular countryside and tough-talking set pieces between noble men of principle. But you don't have to look too closely to see that the movie's core lies the unstated assumption that it's the white man's right to take what he wants. When Dunstan decides he wants to settle, he does the same thing to the Mexicans that the Mexicans did to the Indians before them. He just flatly lays claim to the land and lets his guns do the necessary paperwork. But I told you that. Don Diego, tell him that all the land north of that river is mine. Tell him to stay off of it. Oh, but the land is his. Where did he get it? Oh, many years ago by Grand and Patton, inscribed by the king of all the Spain. You mean he took it away from whoever was here before? Indians, maybe. Hmm, maybe so. Well, I'm taking it away from him. Others have thought as you, senor. Others have tried. And you've always been good enough to stop him? Amigo, it is my work. Pretty unhealthy job. Get away, man. I'm sorry for you, senor. Come on. He called the man senor. He called the man amigo. He called the man sir. And John Wayne still shoots him. It's Dunstan's sense of entitlement that both the audience and the filmmakers just take for granted. Because after all, when the Duke is talking, ethics don't mean squat. 
Right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I walked out one bright sunny morning, I spied a young cowboy loping along, just had to wish her back, his spurs was a jingling, as he come near me, a singing this song. Oop, hi, ya, yo, get along, you little dog. Countless trails were blazed across Texas in the second half of the 19th century. The old Pecos Trail, the Shawnee Trail, the Butterfield Trail. Cowboys were romanticized in pulp novels for readers back east and wildly exaggerated. I hate to burst your bubble, but cowboys did not engage in gunfights. They carried a Colt 45 by their side to fend off predators and rattlesnakes, but the high noon shootout is pure pulp fantasy. Who would agree to do that? Hey, you know what? You're an asshole. And when we get to the end of this trail ride in 20, 30, 40 days, we're gonna stand in the middle of the street and pull our guns and just shoot wildly at each other. Yeah. Then we'll see who's an asshole. That's genius. That's yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Colt 45 was only accurate up to about three yards. Almost every saloon owner made cowboys surrender their weapons at the door. The craziest thing most cowboys ever did was just get drunk at the end of a trail ride and run up and down the street yelling. And the entire era of the range rider only lasted about 20 years. As railroads advanced, the cowboys' trail shortened. The truth is, the cowboy officially died in August 1878 when a man named Gustavus Swift figured out that if you put ice in the top of a boxcar, you could refrigerate beef for transport. The age of the wild and free cowboy was gone. Ranches were the new thing. These ranches grew, and the biggest of them all belonged to the King family. It consisted of 825,000 acres, which covered six Texas counties. That's bigger than Cornwall. Even today, ranches cover a vast part of Texas and play a significant role in the state's economy. What's the best thing about being a rancher? It's uh, just, the, just the lifestyle. Wide open spaces and the animals and, uh, you know. Actually, what we do hadn't changed a lot. There's a little bit of technology, you know, like cell phones and stuff like yeah, that, and the internet and things. What did you used to do? Before you had cell phones, how did you... Well, you, you, you didn't. You, 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 you would watch and see where the guy next to you was, and, and you, would, uh, you would just take your time and make sure you covered the country. And, but I don't know that it makes us any better cow, cowboys, so. though. The rancher has always had to battle to survive. If it's not wildfires, it's banks. If it's not banks, it's dust storms. If it's not dust storms, it's drought. It was really tough last year. We just, uh, if it hadn't rained this year, we'd have been through here. But uh, we're going to make it now, and we'll be able to bring some cows back, and we're going to be all right. Texas has a lot of ranchers. It also has a lot of pseudo-ranchers. When George Bush Jr. claims to be a cattleman, when he, when he uses that cowboy vernacular, usurps that cowboy image, he's actually resorting to the most predictable of Texas class distinctions. Because big swinging dick Texans don't buy Ferraris or yachts. What the hell are they gonna do with a yacht in Texas? Nope, they spread out their insecurities over 200,000 acres of land, and they put some toy cattle on it, and they created an instant distinguished genealogy and a connection to the past and a hell of a photo op. It's the most disgusting kind of sentimentality because it has nothing to do with real ranching. Why don't you ask George Bush Jr. or Ted Turner if they've ever stood in a barn at 3 in the morning in January, knee-deep in placenta, with their elbows shoved up the impacted uterus of some brood cow, or slapped patches of Levi jeans using crazy glue onto the eye of a cow with pink eye, while the mom is three feet away wanting to kill you because basically you're putting super glue onto a calf. I can tell you from experience, there's a huge difference
between being a rancher and owning a ranch. The seat of Texas manhood is and always will be in the saddle. That might be its greatest or its worst distraction, its obsession with symbolic frontiersmanship, its writers, intellectuals, ranchers, oilmen, politicians, and musicians share that core ideal to perpetuate symbolism. They'll never give up on being cowboys. Early cowboys were riders first and last. They were broken in body, twisted in spirit. They worked the trail for four months, got paid $40 at the end of it, burned all their clothes, blew the $40, and started again. They were bruised by debt, loneliness, failure, disease, and untimely death. One of the most tragic figures imaginable. Out of tragedy comes pathos. Pathos transcends to martyrdom. Martyrdom creates heroism. And that is how Texas will forever see itself. If you believe the stereotypes, Texans are loud. Many of them possess bulbous features, but they are vigorous. So on the surface, they're pretty much like the Irish. The difference, of course, is in what lies underneath the surface. In Ireland, it's potatoes. In Texas, it's petroleum. The discovery of oil not only changed Texas forever, but changed the destiny of the entire world. Texas was about to give us a new stereotype. The Stetson-wearing, loudmouth, cigar-smoking oil baron. Just beyond Beaumont is this obelisk honoring Spindletop, the first producing oil well drilled in the state. Here on January 10th, 1901, black gold gushed from the reserves of Texas, the beginning of a tremendous oil empire. The early part of the 20th century, oil was just a nuisance got in the way of farmers who were drilling for water, stank up the marshes of East Texas. Spanish explorers had used it to waterproof their boots. Snake oil salesmen sold it to cure indigestion. As far as refining oil, ah, hell, that was something they did way up in Pennsylvania, not here in Beaumont. But a one-armed, ex-juvenile delinquent born-again Christian named Patillo Bud Higgins had spent some time in Pennsylvania saw that oil was a fledgling industry, and he remembered a 15-foot high mound on the outskirts of his town. The residents of Beaumont had concluded it was just a salt dome because it was covered in salt. But Patillo Bud Higgins believed that underneath that salt was oil. Higgins had no formal understanding of geology. In fact, he quit school at the age of 12. But for some insane reason, he envisioned all of Texas running on kerosene lamps. Never mind that Edison's incandescent bulbs were already lighting up cities back east. In 1892, Higgins wrangled a cheap lease on the salt dome and convinced a water well driller to sink a drill bit into the earth. Well, they hit salt and quicksand. So Higgins found some more investors. They drilled. They hit salt and quicksand. For nine years, Higgins kept poking holes into his stupid hill, running out of money, and then convincing various rubes they should invest in his project. Finally, at the end of 1900, in a last-ditch desperation attempt, Higgins took out an ad in a national magazine to lure more drillers. One person answered the ad. A Croatian salt miner named Anthony Lucas. Lucas had once been a captain in the Austro-Hungarian Navy, but somehow he'd ended up mining salt in Louisiana. Lucas arrived in Beaumont and Higgins more or less turned the entire project over to him. In Pennsylvania, up to this time, if oil was found, it was usually around 50 feet. But Texans don't generally do things half-assed. Lucas and his team drilled to over a thousand feet. The drillers that were on that rig, they had to solve so many problems to bring that well in. There are layers of quicksand, layers of rock, layers of quicksand, and you, so you had to have new ways to get through the quicksand because nobody had dealt with that. So they developed ways to do all of that. Those were very creative men. And then on January 10th, 1901, as two of Lucas's hired hands pulled up a drill to replace a broken bit, the ground suddenly began to shake. First, drilling mud bubbled up out of the hole and just shot into the sky, followed by rocks, 
then the rotten egg smell of natural gas, then the drill casing itself, 1,100 feet of pipe just hurtled straight up into the sky and slammed down like a javelin. They come out and they start cleaning everything up. It's mud, it's water, it is not oil. And the, the rig just starts shaking again. And the youngest one of those drillers was a fellow named Al Hamill. He went over and looked down the hole and he could see the oil. Well, I walked over and looked down in the hole there and uh, hear this frothy oil was starting up. That, uh, it was just uh, breathing like, you know, coming up and sinking back with the gas pressure and, and each flow a little higher and a little higher and a little higher. What shot out of that hole next would change Texas and the world forever. That's right, water, not water, oil. This is just a cheap recreation. It was the future. Cars, and locomotives, and jet liners, and barbecues, and lawnmowers, and tankers, and shady wheelings and dealings with sheiks, and tyrants, and dictators, and presidents. It came up in a huge gusher, and it covered everything. And Lucas was downtown, someone called him, and he said, what is it, what is it? And they said, Captain, it's oil. And it, came, it kept coming out of the ground for almost 10 full days, and it's too much. No one had ever seen a gusher like Spindletop. Higgins had hoped he might get 50 barrels a day from the dome. It shot out more oil than all the wells in America and Russia combined. And by the time it was brought under control and capped nine days later, it had created a 38 million gallon lake of oil. It was too crude to be refined into kerosene, but it made fine fuel oil. And that is what changed the world. It was a quantum leap. Nobody had ever seen oil in that quantity. And it just burst upon the scene January 10th, 1901, and nobody knew what to do with it. And the only way you were gonna make money out of that oil was you have to figure out new ways to use it. So it set off this creative energy, I guess would be a good word for it, and people started looking for ways to use it. Otherwise, everyone is going to go broke. When Spindletop came in in 1901, there were 3,000 cars in the U.S. and 131 miles of paved road. There was one train belonging to the Santa Fe Railroad that ran on oil. Within five years, every train in America ran on oil. The navies of Germany, Britain, and the U.S. had converted their ships to oil. There were 50,000 cars on the road, and there was no turning back. It, it's, it de redefined our way of life, and we do say that it changed the course of world history. It, it made us veer real sharply in a new direction. Overnight, the mosquito-infested backwater of Beaumont turned into a boom town, an orgy of mud, blood, speculators, hookers, pimps, thieves, streamers, and schemers. And it went from a population of 9,000 to over 50,000 practically overnight. Charlatans, con men, uh, legitimate oil men came in, of course, but you had saloon keepers, street walkers. We had. Uh, a boy with the x-ray eyes who uh, advertised that he could look into the ground and see oil under there. And actually, he did find one well. And then he decided he better stop because uh, he shouldn't abuse such a gift. <laughs> it redefined Texas in terms of big oil because many more fields were discovered after Spindletop. It, that was just the beginning. Everybody got the oil fever, and they just began exploring. Strike and oil is easier than spitting here in Texas. Oil comes up no matter where you plan. But I'll bet you never caught a Texas... Call it petroleum, black gold, Texas tea, dinosaur juice. For the most part, it was still snake oil. Texans knew one thing about oil, how to get it out of the ground. They didn't have the money or the equipment to refine or transport it. So that's when all the pilferers and plunderers and petrol profiteers of Pennsylvania showed up like carpetbaggers of yore. 
They laid pipe. They put up storage facilities. They sucked up leases, and they generally fleeced Beaumont for everything they could get their hands on. They gave themselves epic names like the Sun Oil Company, the Texas Oil Company, Gulf Oil, just to let these backwood yahoos know who meant business. One company took the ironic approach, called themselves the Humble Oil Company. Later, they would change their name to Exxon. The Spindletop Discovery started an oil fever that spread through Texas. The state was overrun with people looking to make a fortune. Oil seemed to be everywhere. Spindletop brought the first huge diversification of the economy. Uh, because as the oil industry grew, ultimately by the 1930s, it would generate more money than agribusiness. Millions of dollars worth of oil were being pumped out of the ground every year. It was there for anyone to take. Imagine for a second, growing up as a young man in Texas in the early 1900s. There's no culture, no academia. School is just a place you sit in until it's time to find a job. The rest of America is expanding and industrializing, but all Texas has going for it is it's big and it's full of oil. Many of these entrepreneurial young men became wildcatters. They were true independents, speculators, prepared to borrow a fortune from the bank and then risk it all, drilling for oil on nothing more than a hunch. There has to be that sense of adventure. And if it's missing, you don't want to go into oil. You could lose your shirt growing for oil, and more oil men failed than succeeded because of the extremely high risks, particularly before science could do much to limit risk. And even then, you could lose money on the economics of it. You might find it, but you wouldn't get your money back. I mean, when you're dealing with Mother Earth, you don't know what she's going to do or what curves she's going to throw at you. A lot of the wildcatters didn't care if they got rich or not. What they wanted was to find oil. The search was the interesting part for so many of those men and some women. Nowadays, the most popular poker game in the world is Texas Hold'em. The players are dealt only two cards, then they bet on five communal cards. Everyone knows what's on the table. The winner is the one who can make the most of the paltry hand he's been dealt. With the right amount of bullshit, you can draw some people in and scare other people away. All in. And that is what the Texas oil business was in the 1900s. One giant game of Texas Hold'em. Bluster and bullshit, jackpot or bust, win or go home. It wasn't hard making a fortune. It was hard keeping a fortune. Call. All in. Dead man's hand. Eights and aces. How about three kings? <laughs> a lot of these young men figured out something very quickly. You didn't need a drill to poke holes in Texas. You just needed a fountain pen. Any fellow with an outgoing nature and a bit of savvy could talk some weather-beaten rancher or a lonely old widow into signing an oil lease on their property in exchange for a percentage of vast imagined wealth right underneath the soil. Leases were the currency, the monopoly money of the oil business. They were traded on muddy back streets amongst grimy oilmen, hucksters, and flim-flam artists. They were won and lost in poker games. Their values rose and fell on nothing more than speculation or rumor. Well, it wasn't hard to get a mineral lease, particularly during the 1930s, because farmers were in such tough shape during the Depression. The lease was signed, and ordinarily there was a bonus paid at the time then the lease contained uh, clauses relating to how the owner of the minerals would be repaid for every barrel of oil and then how often he'd be paid and that kind of thing. That looked awfully good to, to farmers anywhere in Texas, to ranchers too. Probably only one in a thousand leases ever led to drilling. Only one in a hundred drillings ever produced oil. But when a well did come in, boom, shakalaka, ka -ching. It fueled another flurry of trading and speculation. 
These early day wildcatters were go for broke. Any one of them would have pissed in the Bacardi breezer of your modern day dot com or hedge fund cowboy who imagines himself to be a rogue and a risk taker. Thank God I, I live now and not then because I surely would have gotten into this myself and I probably would have lost my shirt. And did it pay off for many? Yeah, it sure did. So, if Texans appear to be reckless and arrogant, it's all because of that communal stuff that shot out of the ground in 1901. Should have recognized you from that painting. Here come the... The caricature of the Texas oil man quickly evolved. He was a suave, Stetson maverick, sipping bourbon and reveling in the adrenaline of the game itself. Have you ever heard of a Wheeler dealer? He's a fellow who borrows millions, makes millions, spends millions. The Wheeler dealer never loses, but tax man loses. He usually does on a Henry Tyrone deal. You got me all wrong. You don't go wheeling dealing for money. You do it for fun. Money's just the way you keep score. Or a high rolling white Stetson dimwit with no sense of anything except how to spend his money. Say, now, Henry, whatever it is you're on to, I'll take a fourth of it. And I'll take an eighth. I'll see you eight, and I'll raise you a fourth. The Wheeler Dealers and their hilarious Wheeler Dealer friends, Phil Harris and Chill Wills. Let's highball it to New York. In truth, quite a few oil men did fit this stereotype. The danger lay in the fact that with money comes influence. If Texas were ever to erect a Mount Rushmore of oil men, it would consist of these four men. Roy Cullen, H.L. Hunt, Clint Murkison, and Sid Richardson, all at one time or another were the richest men in Texas, with a combined wealth running into the billions. Their lives constitute a kind of petroleum-based Lord of the Rings. Starting out in the filthy oil fields, their power stretched eventually to every aspect of American business and politics. Directly or indirectly, they put two Texans in the White House, and if you choose to buy into the conspiracy, removed one. They invented the Dallas Cowboys, the Astrodome, and the Super Bowl. They were spectacular philanthropists, cutthroat poker players, mushmouthed aristocrats, hayseed Richard III's, shit kickers with dust on their lizard skin boots doling out pulled pork barbecue to the minions. And they transformed Texas economy into one of the richest in the world. Not one of them ever went to college. Three of them never got past the sixth grade. Their idea of refinement was to accumulate lots and lots of shit and show it off to the world. They were the Kanye West of their day. And much like Kanye West, the president thought they were a bunch of jackasses. So they responded by having the president killed. Oh, At least that's what some people believe. It's death a shot away. It's death a shot away. The death of JFK brought an evil new dimension to the Texas myth. It began in the minds of conspiracy freaks and underground writers and a counterculture suspicious of all things corporate powerful. According to some people, the oil men had Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson in their pocket. There's a story that the night before JFK's assassination, Murkison hosted a party. Johnson attended, and on leaving, apparently said these words, after tomorrow, those SOBs will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. The idea that a cabal of nefarious tycoons could assassinate a president and plot a right-wing takeover? Just an idea too juicy not to take hold of the imagination. At this point in time, can you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald killed President John F. Kennedy by himself? Don't make your decision until you see executive action. In the last two years, Secret Service has established 149 threats against Kennedy's life from Texas alone. Have to send him into hostile territory with no more protection than you and I would arrange for a favorite dog. Two terms for JFK, two for Bobby, and two for Ted. Which makes action now imperative? What kind of action? Executive. Bert Lancaster. I'll take it from here, Bob. 
The Texas oil man might be dumber than a bag of wet mice, but now he was a right-wing nut job intent on taking over the world, or even worse, destroying it. Dr. Strangelove. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. Of course, not everyone buys into that theory. These guys are all over the map in terms of their, their political affinities and their loyalties. Uh, I think Cullen would have had a lot of trouble supporting Lyndon Johnson, frankly. And I don't think he would have been at all happy to think of Johnson in the White House. The only one of the, the big four I really say almost certainly would have liked to have seen that would have been Richardson, but he died before it happened. So I, I think they've got the spotlight on the, on the wrong area there. You and asking the people of Texas to put their confidence in the Democratic Party once again. Essentially, no one will ever really know if these oil barons helped facilitate JFK's death. We stand for the things in which they've But it's left a big stain on the reputation of the Lone Star State. Yes, to the future. There are times that the history of this state leaves a great deal to be desired. I was in Europe right after the Kennedy assassination. And oh, Lord, you didn't want to say that you had been anywhere near this place. And I'm. I was horrified too, just horrified. We stand for the things in which they've always believed. And I believe in 1960 that they're going to say yes to the future. They're going to say yes and put their confidence in our party. The simple trickle-down economic truth was that by the middle of the last century, Texas was cash rich, but impoverished in every other way. Like the generations before them, they'd grown up surrounded by raw nature, hardship, deprivation, no one ever got rich quick selling cattle. Oil changed all of that. But the transition was too much for Texans to take. They'd always expected the wrong things of money, thinking if they just spent unstintingly, they could overcome intellectual or sexual poverty. So they went to town, yee-haw, just waving munificence and seeking desperately for that, that one single purchase that would seal their value in the eyes of the world. New Cadillacs, ranch style houses, wall to wall carpet, shiny appliances, cowhide furniture, steer horn chandeliers, cow poke bric a brac, everything big and gaudy, everything Texas sized. People in Texas like to brag that in Texas you can get in your car and drive and drive and three days later you're still driving through Texas. The proper response to that statement is to reply, yeah, I had a piece of shit car like that myself once. The ultimate stereotype of the raw, hard-living, bourbon-swilling, fist-fighting Texas cash tosser was Diamond Glenn McCarthy. No other oil man rocketed into the public's imagination like him. He was the Texas id, embodied in one man. Now because you wear all An Errol Flynn knockoff, rubbing elbows with Howard Hughes and Hollywood stars, brawling, drinking, and gambling his way from Buffalo Bayou all the way to Sunset Boulevard. When he wasn't drilling, he liked to tool around in his private plane or his four-wheel Jeep, shooting rattlesnakes and armadillos with a Colt 45. Yep, the man exuded pure class. Mr. McCarthy belongs to a breed known as the Texas oil millionaire, almost all of whom were poor wildcatters before they struck it rich in oil. I was 26 years old and I made a million and a half dollars. By the time he was 33, he was thought to have been worth $300 million. That's three quarters of a billion in today's currency. And like most men with gargantuan egos, he decided to create a legacy for himself, his own Taj Mahal, his own Eiffel Tower. Probably no hostelry has become so famous in such a brief period as Houston's fabulous Shamrock Hotel. McCarthy's hotel took three years to build. It cost him $21 million. It opened on St. Patrick's Day, 1949, and it was decadent in every way imaginable. It was to have a two-story lobby covered in emeralds, a five-story parking garage, the largest theater in all of the Southwest, and a swimming pool with green-colored water 
big enough for water skiing. Uh, he wanted to have uh, the biggest hotel in town, partly because that was a challenge to the Houston establishment. It's a mentality with him, I think, uh, not economic practicality. He also had a roughly life-size oil painting of himself put by that downstairs elevator. Gala opening night, Glenn McCarthy hired both a Santa Fe railroad train and a chartered plane to bring in stars from Hollywood. Dorothy Lamore was there as hostess, so was Robert Ryan, Kirk Douglas, Errol Flynn, Ginger Rogers, Lou Costello, Stan Laurel, Edgar Bergen and his wooden puppet Charlie McCarthy, no relation to Glenn. It was all Klieg lights and taffeta, dripping diamonds and mink stoles. There were 10,000 onlookers lining the streets trying to get a glimpse of Hollywood and Texas royalty. The festivities began when a drunken cowboy actor named Red Berry yanked the shoe off of an oil baroness named Ann Justice and began drinking champagne from it. NBC Radio was there, broadcasting it throughout the nation. When Dorothy Lamore stepped up to the mic at precisely 8.30 p.m. to begin the broadcast, 3,000 tipsy Texans started braying and wolf whistling and nobody listening on the radio could understand a single thing that Dorothy Lamore said. Then a broadcast technician interrupted the transmission and uttered the only intelligible thing that anyone at home could hear. His words were, they're fucking it up. The NBC broadcast broke down and went off the air. And the next day, in the eyes of the world, Texas had arrived. The pizza, tell me. McCarthy managed to keep the hotel running for five years. Not once was it ever full. In 1954, it was seized by insurers and given to the Hilton Hotel chain. In 1984, the greatest hotel ever built in America was donated to the Texas Medical Center. And then they knocked it down. Well, I didn't have uh, any old friends in the oil business. But... When McCarthy died, obituaries went out of their way to describe the man as charismatic, flamboyant, charming, unabashed, characteristics that presumably disappeared when they stuck him in front of a TV camera. When newsman Mike Wallace interviewed him in 1957, McCarthy was slightly more animated than the smoke drifting out of Wallace's cigarette. All right, Glenn, as far as mixing between white and Negro, you're against it. You've said you just can't breed a prize bull with a scrub heifer. And you said it frequently. What do you mean by that? Well, it's a, it would be a long explanation. If, Why? Uh, to try to explain what you mean by that, uh, you when you try to raise registered cattle, you attempt to put registered bulls with registered heifers. Well, are you are and you suggesting a, that, a, that that the white is a prize bull? And the Negro is a scrub heifer? I'm uh, not uh, saying it uh, in that way, I don't believe. He was kind of deflated in terms of his prominence by the time Wallace interviewed him. He had really long since tired out uh, the establishment in Houston. Again, his boisterous quality and uh, flamboyance and his tendency to show up and be loud uh, in the wrong places at the wrong times. He'd worn out his welcome, I think. How a monosyllabic racist oilionaire who somehow confuses integration with cattle breeding ever managed to magnify himself in the eyes of the world is pure Texas mystique. But that's always been Texas' best PR stunt, mythologizing itself. Larger-than-life characters make Texas larger than life. Now, greatness returns to the screen. Yes! Glenn McCarthy's most lasting imprint would never be a hotel, it would be the fictionalization of his persona. The 1956 film Giant, directed by George Stevens, based on the Edna Ferber novel, modeled its protagonist, Jet Rink, on Glenn McCarthy. Rink, played by James Dean, is a hired hand on a cattle ranch run by Bick Benedict and his wife, played by Rock Hudson and Elizabeth Taylor. In the film, the class delineations couldn't be more obvious, more black and white. It's almost as if the film was written by a British person. When his tiny plot of land produces a wildcat strike, Rink's fortunes change instantly. James Dean is full of coarse animal vitality. 
Rock Hudson and Elizabeth Taylor are stalwarts of Texas ennui. That sure is a beautiful animal. Beautiful. Because Hudson's character, Bick Benedict, is clearly based on the patriarchs of the King Ranch, and Jet Rink is based on the Wildcatter McCarthy, in one single scene, we get to see the transition of old cattle Texas to new Petro Texas. The contrast couldn't be more obvious. Well, you sure did look pretty in this business. You always did look pretty. Just pretty now, good enough to eat. Wait, 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 wait
You know, there are only two things more beautiful than a good gun. A Swiss watch or a woman from anywhere. You ever had a good Swiss watch? From the first women who arrived here and for generations afterwards, Texas was never going to be an easy place. Men who expressed themselves through their work found it very hard to relate to women. They were mutually frightened of each other. The Texans' code prepared them to think of women not as they really were, but as some naive idealization to which they could never conform. This shakes a man's confidence and accounts for a lot of his riding off into the sunset on a horse or behind the wheel of a Cadillac. This sense of estrangement was captured perfectly by Peter Bogdanovich in The Last Picture Show, probably one of the greatest films ever made about Texas. Anarene, Texas, 1951. Nothing much has changed. The film uses the closing of the town's only movie theater as a motif to symbolize the changes that were happening to Texas in the 1950s. The theater is owned by Sam the Lion, played by Ben Johnson. I heard about the ball game last night. 121 to 14. He's just about the only self-sufficient and self-satisfied man in town. I'm not sorry for you. The rest of the town is infected by a general malaise. Basically, the only thing that reminds anyone they're alive is infidelity. What do you think you'd do if you found us? Shoot us, probably. But Mama, it's a sin, isn't it? Unless you're married, you know I wouldn't do that. <sighs> Don't be so mean now. In Anarine, the nourishing myth of the West is just blowing away in the dust. And against this backdrop, we meet two high school seniors named Sonny and Dwayne, who both fall in love with a calculating high school beauty queen named JC, who, for lack of anything better to do, manipulates just about every boy in town. Oh, quit prison. I don't think you did it right anyway. I'll stay with her all night one of these nights, too. She done promised. You won't either. Yes, I will. Why shouldn't I? In the end, Sonny has an unresolved affair with the coach's wife, and Dwayne goes off to fight in Korea. There are two deaths in the film, and no babies are born. We're left to think of Anarine as some half-remembered backdrop from an old movie set. The film is a stunning portrait of a small town reeling from the furious transition that's always been part of Texas. You wouldn't believe how this country's changed. I reckon the reason why I always drag you out here is probably I'm just as sentimental as the next fella when it comes to old times. Old times. In HUD, another film based on a Larry McMurtry novel, Paul Newman plays a small-town Texan angry at the world changing around him. He wants to be a gunfighter, but there's no one left to fight. So he drives around town in a big Cadillac, getting into brawls and having affairs with women, using the only seduction technique that he understands. Did you ever ask? Well, the only question I ever ask any woman is what time is your husband coming home? HUD is a lost man in the changing West. This is most notable in his prized possession, a Cadillac a machine. Old Texans related to horses, and a horse was something you had to depend on. But poor Hud has resigned to parading around town with a status symbol, a car he can barely afford, but the only thing that separates him from anyone else in town. In Texas, sex and money are generally interchangeable topics. Naturally, if you combine these two potent elements, you come up with the ultimate Texas caricature, the uber-Texan, the Texan we all think of if we think of Texas at all. And that man, of course, is J.R. Ewing. Don't be too sanctimonious. Rudolph Millington. The lady and I were together. The lady and I are in love. Say, do you have a young man uh, named Rudolph Millington working for you? Well, I hate to be the one to tell you, but he's got no character at all. I'm afraid you're out of a job, Mr. Millington. Hold it right there, Rich. Are you actually trying to tell us that a vindictive, one-dimensional, crude, sexually dysfunctional star of some cheesy nighttime soap opera is actually the ultimate representation of the modern Texas man? That's exactly what I'm saying. J.R. Ewing is the metamorphosis from cowboy to urbanite. Oh, he uses a checkbook instead of a handgun, drives a Cadillac instead of a horse, but underneath is the same 
frustrated, ambivalent, emasculated Texas guy. The Western has never been a responsible genre. It took J.R. Ewing to step the Texans' image down from myth and romance, a load of old bullshit, to caricature, a new level of bullshit. But at least it knew it was being ironic. Dallas has always been a town that celebrates wealth and ostentation over culture. Those who live there are downright suspicious of anyone whose politics are not like their own. T for Texas, T for Tennessee. But the true political heart of Texas isn't in Dallas. It's 200 miles south in Austin. T for Thelma, the gal that made a wreck out of me. Texas likes to think of itself as the big wide open, but 80% of it is urban. 60% of those people live in the triangle between San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. Still, it practices an empty state kind of politics. In other words, we don't need your help, Mr. Federal Government, because we have big hats. It leads the nation in petroleum, agriculture, natural gas, chemicals. It's last in health care. Has the highest unwanted pregnancy rate in America. But its schools don't teach sex education. They teach abstinence. This is the mandate of Governor Rick Perry, the immaculately coiffed Republican from Big Springs, Texas, who likes to name his cowboy boots. The one on the left is called Freedom, the right one is called Liberty. And he announced to the nation in 2012 that God had told him to run for president. Perry failed to get the presidential nomination, which if nothing else proves that God's advice is not always that sage, which comes a little too late for Abraham. However, on the subject of sexual abstinence, Perry is focused and succinct to the point of denying his own existence. Absence works. But we are the third highest teen pregnancy. We have the third highest teen pregnancy rate among all states in the country. The questioner's point is, it doesn't seem to be working. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you from, <laughs> I'm going to tell you from my own personal uh, life, abstinence works. And I ran against Rick in 2006. Uh, I ran as an independent for governor. Uh, people are very worried about me being a comedian, about having a clown in the governor's mansion at the time. And now I think they realize we've had one for the past 12 years, Rick Perry. The Aggies and, and the women uh, are all telling Rick Perry jokes. You know, I mean, it's the whole state. There's not one young person that wants to grow up to be Rick Perry. Still, my definition of politics holds. Poly means more than one, and ticks are blood-sucking parasites. Whatever you think of his policies, the fact is the people of Texas keep voting for Perry to run their state. God knows why. Sometimes you get the sense that for all its outward optimism, Texans cling far too much to their memories. But they can't help believe that maybe yesterday was better than anything the future can offer. And no nostalgic notion of Texas is more dramatically packaged than gridiron football. Certainly it isn't necessary to remind football fans that the annual Cotton Bowl game is one of the great sports classics of the year. NFL and college football has always been a big pull. They can draw upwards of 80,000 fans to their games and they all manage to behave themselves immaculately. And through it all, the crowd, though definitely partisan, plays the role of the sportsman to the visiting team. But only in Texas does this obsession extend to high school. The phenomenon known as Friday Night Lights. If that sounds vaguely extraterrestrial, it's because it is. If you were to fly over Texas on a Friday night in the autumn, you would see an amazing luminescence. Thousands of football stadiums lit up, full of students, CEOs, hairdressers, dry cleaners, ministers, even future presidents, all sitting in the stands watching 16-year-old kids try to kill each other. The identities of entire communities live or die with the success of the local football team. It's the embodiment of everything Texans believe in. It shows the influence of sports on American life. 
As the saying goes, with clear eyes and a full heart, you can't lose, which is bullshit. You need a big defensive line. Hey. The helm of this symbological order is the head coach. At most Texas high schools, he's more or less the king. So don't sit back thinking, oh, man, you're doing good. Oh, yeah. I don't care what the score is. If you're out there, you are playing giving 110%. You understand that? Yes, anybody have a question about anything? Yes, everybody knows what you're supposed to do. Yes, is anybody confused about anything? Yes, you're confused. If you don't want to follow his orders, he will happily show you the door. Because sometimes he asks to answer to an entire town on Monday morning what happened to 30 people on a Friday night. That's just the way it is. Every once in a while, some small town civic leader will complain that maybe the coach has too much power. Maybe there's too much emphasis on sports and not enough on teaching. But 10,000 people in Texas don't show up on Friday night to watch a math teacher solve X. Chance to give everything we have, everything we have. Don't hold anything back. Right? Yes, sir. Has everybody got that? Yes, sir. Let's get up and get out there. Here we go. Get out there. To the uninitiated Brit, American football may appear to be a bit chaotic. So let me let me explain what's going on on this particular play. The quarterback, the designated team leader, hunches up behind the center player in a somewhat sodomitic position, surrounded by the company of his burly peers. He will execute a running play or a pass play, his option with the understanding that the fans watching equate his athletic performance with sexual identity. The men in the stands participate in this moment vicariously, remembering the glory days when they too played football, thus allowing the quarterback to compensate for their fading masculinity. The quarterback drops into the pocket, points the ball directly away from any women who are further demeaned by being forced to cheerlead in tight skirts and applaud the prowess of the male. If the quarterback is any good at all, he will eventually shed himself of this pressure and go on to live a normal life. Unlike most of the men in the stands who have lost all perspective of their true self-worth and are still pretending they're 16 and banging the prom queen. Okay, maybe I'm being a bit too Freudian and over-analytical about a football game. Maybe it's just a chance for a bunch of hyperactive young men to blow off some excess energy by tossing around a pigskin. But Texans cling to certain rituals and identities with such fervor and passion that you can't help but wonder if they're afraid that those identities and rituals are going to disappear. In a very short amount of time, Texas went from being rural to urban. And it's that seething sense of abandonment that infects its psychology. It's no coincidence that some of the evilest movies ever made are set in Texas. Tom Dunstan in Red River is easily John Wayne's most psychopathic character. The Coen brothers' first movie, Blood Simple, takes place in a small Texas town. So does No Country for Old Men. If you go into a movie and come out and feel like you've just spent two hours in desolate Texas, Texas has done its job. It begins with that line of rickety houses. Those white people trying to push the frontier, those lone wolf families out there on the edge of civilization out of sheer stubbornness. And pretty soon, someone's running around with a chainsaw or shooting strangers in the head with a nail gun. By far, the evilest movie ever made in Texas was Urban Cowboy. Oh, I'm sorry, not the evilest, the vilest. If for no other reason, because it created a worldwide fad where millions of sozzled suburban women could get rhinestone to the hilt, and bovinely express their individuality through line dancing. It's supposed to be some sort of treatise on transitional Texas, but it's not. Just a hackneyed ripoff of Saturday Night Fever made by Hollywood Neanderthals to exploit John Travolta's dance prowess. It's hard to say who's more mechanical, Travolta's acting or the bull. But there was that ripple effect. Urban Cowboy made its nightclub setting, Gillies, a national entity and helped revive a flagging interest in country music. She gonna head right back to Texas, change her address and the number on her phone. 
Austin is the one Texas town that breeds true tolerance. It celebrates individualism and embraces diversity. Probably because it's a government seat and home to over 50,000 University of Texas students, it's a honky-tonk crockpot of idealist intellectuals and artistic refugees. Okay, here's a question. Who has the most number one singles in popular music, Elvis or the Beatles? Pencil's ready. The answer is neither. It's George Strait. Who? Exactly. There's a good chance you've never even heard of George Strait. In Texas, that would make you a big fat loser. The man reigns. He, he set the standard. He set the standard for people like Clint Black to come along and kind of do the same thing. And uh, pretty much every, every true country singer that's come after that, you can hear the George Strait influence. Uh, huge influence. You know, he's one of the guys that never changed. I mean, he started doing straight ahead country from the, from the word go, and he still does it. And he can still fill up venues, you know, huge venues. Here she comes a walking, talking to love, saying I've been looking for you. George Strait is the living link between uh, Western swing and honky tonk music of 50s artists like Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys and Spade Cooley and his orchestra and the modern Texas troubadour movement. Western swing began in the dance halls of small towns throughout the lower Great Plains in the late 20s and early 30s. It grew out of house parties and ranch hoedowns where fiddlers and guitarists played for dancers. Amplified instruments, especially the steel guitar, gave the music its unique sound. Modern Texas music, particularly the music made here in Austin, still embodies that spirit. It's a far cry from the schmaltz churned out by Nashville. In fact, if you were to ask me, this is just my opinion, what is Texas' most redeeming feature, I would answer in a heartbeat. Austin music, call it no depression, outlaw music, Americana, alternative country. It's a distinct genre that more than makes up for the let's put a blanket on the ground, corn, pone, and molasses that defines most country music in America. Hello, all. Hello. Hello. How'd things go for you today? Willie Nelson began his performing career here in 1964 at a club called The Broken Spoke. By the 70s, places like Antone's and the Armadillo World Headquarters were showcasing acts as diverse as Lyle Lovett, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and ZZ Top. Texas is a good melting pot for every style imaginable, and, and it just so happens that it kind of all culminates in Austin. The, the country, the, kind of the singer-songwriters in Austin are just as much rock influenced as, as they are as they are country I think you know, you know even as far back as you know Waylon and Willie they, they kind of started the the whole uh, outlaw movement here in the early 70s it, it seems like the boundaries of the music are, are way broader you know and, and for the most part for most most of the people I work with they have no boundaries I mean I've worked on records with people that will do a conjunto song followed by a western swing followed by a you know, Chuck Berry feeling rock and roll thing. Today it's the home of the largest ongoing music festival in the world, the South by Southwest Festival, which has fostered artists like Hayes Carl. Robert Earl Keane, Kerry Rodriguez, and Lucinda Williams. We got $900 and never did suspect the world the hurt would be in. I think the Texas music scene has driven the rest, rest of, the, of the country somewhat. You know, as, as far as singer-songwriters, they kind of look to Texas to see what's happening first. And it is really strange how many musicians, whether they be black blues singers or country singers or, or today's crop of musicians, all seem to come from Texas. Well, you got all the right equipment, and it's working like it should. But before I drive it off the lot, I gotta make sure that warrant is good. The troubadour sound is plaintive and lyric driven. And like most things in Texas, roots itself in frontier symbolism, though somewhat apologetically. To paraphrase Hayes Carl, boy, you ain't a poet. You're just a drunk with a pen. 
Just trust me, baby, I wouldn't think of doing you wrong. It's, it's hard to describe, but, but I, I hear a lot, of, a lot of Texas in a lot of these artists, even if they're not trying to be so. You know, it's like just, it's in their blood. So it comes, comes through when, they, uh, when it comes out of their veins, when they're writing a song, you know. The road goes on forever and the party never ends. Part of what's great about Texas is the Buddy Holly effect, is why a guy like Buddy Holly could be so pure original. It's because of where he was. He was in Lubbock. He was surrounded by endless miles of emptiness. He didn't have all the influences that we have today. I mean, if Buddy had been living in New York, would he have, or California, would he have produced anything? I doubt it. Willie Tiss. This is probably where I should end, with a place and a people who take the fiction of Texas and turn it into something gallant, great music. So much of modern Texas is about old Texas, those images and experiences that come from equal parts strength and disappointment. The cowboy faded away. The oil business went boom, then bust, then boom, then bust in the 80s. Now it's back again, because a Texan never loses sight of his expansiveness. And if everything's bigger in Texas, then surely that includes egos. You know, we, of all people, talk about ourselves way too much. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but we do. And um, when people look at us and kind of shake their heads, I have to say, we bring some of that on ourselves because we're so fascinated with ourselves. Texas, screw you. Texas is heartbreakingly friendly and embraces everyone. I, I think there's a kind of residual optimism you know, uh, that things will get better or they'll continue to be good. And I think there's still a, a kind of individualism. There is a wonderful spirit of territory, I guess, a, a sense of place here that, uh, you know, I am a Texan. I've always been. I like visiting other places, but it's always a comfort to know that I get to go back home. I'd say the Alamo is probably one of the very smallest missions, and it's very fragile, and it's uh, probably the most precious piece of real estate in Texas. It's ironic that in a state where bigger seems always to be better, that the Alamo should be so significant. When Jeffrey Skilling, the CEO of Enron, graduated from Southern Methodist University in Dallas and applied to business school at Harvard, he was asked by the bursar, why do you feel you deserve to go to Harvard? He said, because I'm fucking smart. I'm the fucking smartest guy in the room. Today, Skilling is serving a 25-year sentence for securities fraud and conspiracy after bringing down Enron and setting into motion the near collapse of the U.S. economy. So in his present situation, it's probably safe to say he is the smartest guy in the room. But that statement shows just how much he lost sight of his Texasness. He wasn't that guy on the emotional frontier with the big Texas sky behind him. He was just a guy in a room. And that ain't fucking Texas. All the way from Beaumont With a white rose in my hand I could not wait forever, baby I hope